Okay, so, so thank you. Uh, my name's Graham West. Uh, I'm here from the University of Strathclyde. Uh, I meant to mention as well uh, my colleague uh, uh, Stephen MacArthur, Professor Stephen MacArthur. Thanks for the promotion there. I'm not quite a professor yet. But, uh, yeah, so I want to talk to you um, briefly about some of the, the, the successes that we've had, not in oil and gas, but in related in the, the, the electrical energy sector. Um, I do a lot of work with, with um, the nuclear operator in the UK and in Canada, um, so EDF Energy and Bruce Power, um, and a lot with the, um, the, the transmission grid and the, uh, and the DNOs in, in terms of the electrical uh, um, transmission and distribution industry within the UK. Um, so I'm going to give you a, um, a brief introduction to sort of like my take on, on sort of data analytics and the application of that, uh, and then I'll go on to some some success stories, uh, some projects that I've been involved in um, as, a, as a, um, an academic at university, but partnering with industry, uh, delivering out value and benefit to, uh, to our partnering uh, industry uh, uh, collaborators. So in terms of, though I'm an academic, I, I work very closely with industry, uh, and, and up here are some of the, um, I guess, some of the drivers uh, that, that I look to when, um, when, when I'm dealing with the, you know, particularly the nuclear industry. Uh, it's not oil and gas, but hopefully it's, uh, uh, it, it resonates with some of your issues um, that you're having in the oil and gas industry. We're talking about things like lifetime extension of plant, um, so that's understanding current condition, being able to predict future uh, condition of, of plant accurately and effectively, uh, reduction in unplanned outages, um, so in order to do that, we need to improve things like improved anomaly detection, uh, fault diagnosis, classification of, of, of faults, uh, and then prediction of, of likely de uh, degradation mechanisms. Um, we want to reduce, uh, we want to increase the, uh, the periods between uh, inspection outages. Um, you know, when your, 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 your plants or your assets are offline, they're not generating uh, uh, revenue, so we want to maximize that, provided it's safe to do so. Um, and we're also looking at uh, optimizing um, uh, optimization of maintenance, so ensuring you've got the right spare parts in the in the right places to uh, again minimize your, your your downtime. If we look at this list of industry requirements uh, and highlight certain words there, uh, understanding, prediction, anomaly detection, fault diagnosis, this all leads towards the the area of data analytics, data science, uh, use data analytics, data science, machine learning. There's a lot of terminology within that, that area. From the field of academia, a lot of it drives it out. You've got uh, companies like Facebook, um, your Amazons, your Apples that are, are driving a lot of the, uh, the fundamental research within this area. They've got a different set of driv uh, business drivers than, than maybe the energy industry, um, but there's a lot of tie across in terms of um, they're, they're getting a lot of value out of their data. And really, that's, that, that's what this is about, is, is uh, how can the, the energy industry, you know, in, in general, maximize the use of its, it, it, its data? Um, as I say, there's differences between the models, you know, with, with your Amazons who are effectively trying to, to sell your products and, uh, and the energy industry where they've got, you know, assets and infrastructure that's used to generate their, uh, their revenue. We've got physical models. We've got physical items that, that, that we're looking to, uh, to draw conclusions about rather than it being personal preferences or, um, you know, or relationships between spending patterns or things that, that might go in the other industries. But I think there's a lot that, 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 we, that we can learn from that, and there's certainly a lot that we've taken from that, that domain and applied within the, uh, the electrical uh, energy industry. So a couple of uh, uh, delving into that sort of the, the, the requirements for, uh, well, electrical generation, you've got nuclear or wind, uh, that's uh, Bruce Power site over in Canada. Um, the challenges that, that we're facing here are things like legacy data issues. So we've got a, an infrastructure, Hunterston B power station in the UK, uh, which is still operating, generating electricity, was, was commissioned in 1976. So back then, um, you know, it was a power station, it was still a power station, but the, the actual way we gathered data about that was very different than, than what we've got, got today, but it's the same asset. Um, we've got modernization of data capture, um, storage. We've got much, much more access to that data. Uh, but that's, that, that, that's, that's a challenge for that, that, that's prevalent across the, uh, the, the generation industry. Safety and reliability standards. So uh, it's a big, big issue, particularly within the nuclear industry. 
Uh, it doesn't matter so much if you, you ask Alexa to, to play you the Rolling Stones and, and Justin Bieber comes on instead. You know, that, that's okay. You can live with a, a, a bit of uncertainty there. But if you're doing it within a you know, highly regulated domain, you don't necessarily want your, your artificial intelligence or your, 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 your data science to be telling you the wrong answer there. Standards and regulations around telecommunications, it's sort of the whole um, um, privacy issue with the, with, with the data. That's something that's, that's coming along um, you know, with your Facebooks and the recent rev, you know, revelations there. But within the, uh, within the energy industry, that's, that's vital. You know, the security of your data uh, is very, very important. We've got large numbers of data sources, and this is a big, big differentiator as well is that um, your Amazons and your Googles and people that are driving a lot of that fundamental stuff in, in, in data analytics, they get their labels, they get their information about the data effectively for free. It costs our industry a lot of money to go out there and get that information. You know, go and gather the, uh, the, the, the information about the health of your particular piece of asset, you know, whether it's a compressor or, or that. There's, there's a real cost associated with that. Whereas you know, Amazon or Netflix, you know, if you, you like a movie on that, it costs them very little to, 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 to gather that data. So that's a big differentiator. And that underpins a lot of the tools and techniques that we use. And then the final point is looking at uh, software development and, uh, and data analytics ca uh, capabilities. You know, like the, your Amazons or your Facebooks are, are effectively digital industries. They don't have this infrastructure. They've grown up with data. That's their, that's their business. Whereas within the energy industry, we've got assets and the data sort of come along afterwards. As I said, Hunterston back in 1976 when it started generating electricity, what was the, what was the technology like there? What were computers like in 1976? Certainly not, nowhere near the, you know, the, this sort of level of uh, you know, capabilities. But we were still able to, 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 you know, to run those power stations. But in terms of the engineers that are doing that, do they have that, you know, that, that, that set of data analytics capabilities. If we go over to electricity networks, we're seeing a very similar story. Legacy data systems, you know, the infrastructure in terms of the transmission grid within the UK um, is, is old as well. Um, you've got communication issues there that might, might echo some of the, the, the comms issues in the, the oil and gas industry. Again, large number of data sources, but the cost of gathering and labeling that data is expensive. And again, not a, a huge workforce that's, you know, that's, that's into machine learning and data analytics there. So what does the industry need? Um, I propose it's, it's decision support through uh, something we call uh, agile analytics. So uh, we're not talking about uh, building this huge sort of monolithic data structure that sucks up all your data and then applying the analytics on top of that. We much, very much believe it's a uh, when you've got an existing asset, it's about improving one particular asset or one particular problem that you have, and then building on that, demonstrating the success of that to then lead to the, to the next project, to tackle the next project. This is our experiences with the, uh, particularly with the nuclear industry um, within the UK and within, within Canada. It's not coming in there and trying to solve all their data problems in one go. It's about choosing the, the low-hanging fruit, the, the stuff that you can make the, the real impact in um, before you then extend that and show that capability and, uh, and extend that. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back and revisit that through the, uh, through the course of the presentation. Okay, so one more buzzword. Um, I like to badge all this as, as industrial informatics. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots, I said, lots of terminology, but I'm an academic and we like to sort of, you know, come up with a, you know, the, the, the term that encompasses that. But what do I mean by uh, industrial informatics? We're talking about uh, really asset health management, and that's at a number of levels, whether that's taking offline data and supporting offline inspections, whether that's online inspection, condition monitoring data. Normally, we're dealing with time series data. Normally, there's some underlying process there that we're trying to, to understand the health of. Again, this is reflecting what's the differences between that industry and, say, you know, your Facebooks or your Amazons where you're trying to you know, understand, uh, you know, preferences in terms of what type of film do you like. Um, and then there's a, a bit about real-time or control. I've got that down at the bottom. That's, I guess, the most challenging. And as you're going down here, uh, also in terms of the immediacy, the need for making decisions uh, will depend on 
whereabouts you are on this, uh, on this path. Sometimes it's time critical, particularly offline if you're looking at return to service, so there might be a time pressure there. Um, but are we down at the real time? Not often when we're talking about asset management. The types of defects and degradation that we're looking at aren't manifesting themselves in, you know, second, microsecond timescales. It's, you know, over a long period of time. Types of decisions we're supporting is from, uh, I guess, the most simple, which is just looking at whether there's something wrong or whether everything's uh, okay, to then drilling down into things like fault classification, providing diagnostics on root causes of those faults, then down into things like prognostics, which is not just understanding what the current health of your assets are, but being able to prove what future uh, health of those are. And that feeds into things like maintenance scheduling uh, and fleet-wide management as well. And there's a whole bunch of techniques there. Uh, what I'd like to highlight as well is that, you know, I, I, I would throw in things like image and, and signal processing in there. I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer. It's not all just about, like, the classical computer science stuff, but there's also uh, the need to, to transform data um, and sometimes that's the, that, 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 that can be incredibly beneficial to, uh, to the industrial partners. It's maybe not the, the really clever stuff, but it's, a, 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 it's some of the, the underlying the way you present the data. And down at the bottom, this can be done um, in several levels. It's, it's, it's either down to the individual component or subcomponent of your system. So you can apply all of this to, to looking at uh, um, turbine blades, or you can scale it up to the, to the full turbine, or you can scale it up to you know, a fleet of assets, you know, your whole, uh, your whole fleet of, of, of turbines. Okay, um, just a, a, a quick sidestep on to big data. Um, I like to make this point that this, this slide here is taken from uh, a review that was done in 2014, so some of the data is, is maybe just slightly out of date, but um, big data is a term that is banded about at the moment. And do we have a big data problem? Um, it's got certain uh, descriptions of, of it. If you know, big data is generally described as the four Vs to do with the velocity variety uh, and various, various other aspects. But here we've got sort of down from the one gigabyte, which is the data collected by Google Car in one second, up to uh, the square kilometre array, um, which are looking at the space, uh, looking for extraterrestrial, you know, 350 exabytes per year. What I've done is I've taken this timeline and put the sort of data sources that I'm looking at for the, 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 the nuclear power industry on that. So down here we've got uh, the, uh, uh, the turbine data for a whole year for uh, one of the, the, uh, the steam turbines on uh, one of the UK's nuclear power plants. You know, we're down at this, this sort of level and there's not huge amounts of data there. But up to here, this is a, a Canadian design of reactor. Um, during an outage, they'll do an ultrasonic inspection of the full sort of uh, six and a half metre length of it, you're, ga you're, you're gathering a couple of, couple of terabytes worth of data, but we're not way up here. You know, so the challenges in terms of big data challenges, we're not really up there. We might have large volumes or considerable volumes of data, but it's not the same sort of challenges where you've got so much data that you can't actually physically process that in the, in the conventional sense. So... I don't think we're up here dealing with some of the challenges that likes of Facebook or Twitter might be by looking at. Um, we're much more down towards the bottom end of that big data scale. Okay, so that was a, 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 a broad introduction. I'll now go through a couple of case studies. Uh, I've been particularly involved for the past 15 years or so working with EDF Energy, primarily looking at, uh, at their graphite core. And this is a cutaway of a uh, of one of the gas-cooled reactor stations within the UK. Uh, and I've developed a number of systems that uh, have grown from a, a university prototype system to be then deployed within industry and then picked up by industrial partners and are delivering that, that decision support benefit out to, uh, out to industry. So I'll just uh, skip through this. There's a, a number of different applications. So I'm looking at refueling data, uh, looking at uh, uh, inspection of the reactor cores, looking at control rod movements, um, and we've also been looking at some of the balance of plants, some of the, the gas circulators and the steam turbines as well. Um, but diving into just a, a couple of these in a bit more detail, one I want to speak about is, is, is the graphite core. So for EDS, the graphite cores are one of the life-limiting factors of their power station. Um, it can't be replaced, so understanding its health is, is critical. 
And if they understand the health of it, then they can make the case for uh, continued and extended operations. So that's part of the, the safety case. So when they refuel a reactor, then they gain this bit of data here, fuel grab load trace, which gives them, uh, well, this data originally wasn't designed for condition monitoring purposes. This is uh, really reactor trip protection. So while you're refueling the reactor, if you're pulling it out and there's a problem and it gets stuck, then you, know, then you can trip the reactor and safely deal with it. But subsequently, it was, it was discovered that we could get some information about the, uh, about the condition of the, 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 the structure of the core from, from this data. So effectively, what we're doing is we're looking at lots and lots of this data, and we can do our anomaly detection on it. Here's an example of this is a, uh, a defective uh, trace as opposed to the, the normal trace. We can do classification. That was turned into a, a, a system uh, that was deployed out to, out to EDF to support them when they're uh, refueling any of their, uh, uh, any of their uh, power stations. So we're bringing in their theoretical understanding as well of the behavior of the, uh, the degradation mechanisms within the core uh, and combining that with the data analytics techniques. So in terms of, I spoke about agile journey. This is what I'm, what I'm talking about in terms of uh, us as a university, we developed this as a bit of software that was then um, trialed, prototyped, used by EDF, but in, a, uh, in an advisory role in, in terms of uh, uh, building up the confidence in the use of it before then uh, it moving over to, to full deployment by a, a, a third party. So it sort of then no longer becomes research, but it's, you know, it's a, a, an industrial deliverable there. Another example is, uh, is inspection of the reactor cores. So the previous data was every time they refuel it and it refuels online. This is offline inspection. And this is much more about uh, image and video processing. So um, currently what they do is they will, will stick a camera into the core during an outage and, and inspect certain fuel channels. Uh, if they find a defect of interest, then they'll uh, stitch together um, a, a, a montage of the, uh, of the defect and use that to, to, to understand its, its behavior uh, and sign that off before return to service. So this is on the critical outage path. What we've done is we've taken the same data here and fully automated the process so we can generate out, a, uh, we call it a channelama or a channel panorama um, taken from the same data that's gathered, but we're doing it a lot more efficiently. So this image here is produced automatically in 20 minutes as opposed to this one, which takes up to a full working day, depending on the complexity of the defect, to manually go in, isolate the frames, and stitch them together. Um, some details here, but because it's on the critical outage path, because uh, this is one of those time-pressured situations, we're saving uh, significant amounts of time there. And um, we're freeing up the, uh, the, the, the engineer's time, the analyst's time, so that they're not building these sorts of images, but they're spending the time analyzing the, uh, and, and assessing the images. Uh, again, that's a, uh, an agile journey. We're going from uh, university software uh, deployed in 2014, used in parallel with the manual analysis process to then uh, becoming a, 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 an industrial deployed system where the research is kind of finished in that, that part and it's, it's going on and, uh, and providing benefit to, to, to EDF. Uh, Given the time, and I've already been given an extra five minutes for this session, uh, I won't go into pole-mounted auto reclosers, but it's not just in the nuclear industry, but across the... Uh, we're seeing similar stories within, uh, um, uh, in this case, Scottish Power, and looking at their, uh, some of their devices on the, uh, on the electrical network. And these are devices that, uh, if a branch falls onto a, a line, you don't want to um, you know, isolate... You want to isolate the line, but then you want to throw the... Uh, the switch is back on if the fault is cleared. So it's a it's a it's a device that will reclose a, uh, on a on a faulted line sort of three times, and then take out the service if it's a permanent fault. Here we were looking at the uh, the transition of a transient fault into semi permanent or permanent fault, uh, and there's some details here about the the underlying prognostic uh, algorithms that we've used. But uh, if you're interested in that, speak to me in the uh, in the break. So. A number of key research topics, I, I guess this is a bit more from the, the, the academic point of view, but some of the challenges that I see, particularly within the area of machine learning and, and data analytics, is the embedding of knowledge-based techniques along with your data. So it's 
So it's all very well having the, you know, these data analytics techniques, but you also need the underlying explanation. Certainly that's true of the nuclear industry. You know, you don't want a black box telling you, you know, this, this, this item of plant is safe to run. You want to be able to provide the, 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 the dialogue or the reasoning behind those decisions. Um, a number of more, um, I guess, uh, research areas, incremental learning, uh, active learning, really how do the engineers, how do the, the users inter interface with that? Again, going back to Facebook, Facebook's an application that, you know, all the, the interactions done with that. A lot of the decisions that are made within the nuclear industry are taking data off, processing it, but maybe on their desk, pulling together different sources of data. We need to have a mechanism of, of, of engaging the, the human in that, that decision-making process with the machine. Um, and this is back to our, our agile journey. This was an activity that was done with Bruce Power, who own and uh, run the largest nuclear power plant in the world. Um, you'll probably recognize some of these, the, these data sources down here, Maximo, Pi Historian, Smart Signal. You know, it's common to the, the oil and gas industry. But what we're doing is we're effectively taking slices through this. We're doing similar sorts of data sources, uh, an extensible and flexible architecture that then allows us to do our, our analysis on it. Um, and the key part is that it's, we're doing this in slices. We're not trying to build this whole thing and then do data analytics on top of it. Uh, it's, this, it's this staged approach because you just you pick low-hanging fruit for one project, you show the benefit of it, that, that, uh, then you can then use that as a selling point for the, uh, the, the next stage. Um, and just as the last, uh, the last slide, this is really summarizing uh, the successes we've had is the engagement of a, a university with our industrial partners. So we've got the Advanced Nuclear Research Centre at Strathclyde. It's your EDF Energy, Bruce Power, Connectrix, all working in slightly different areas, but they're all coming together with the same underlying problems of being able to uh, capitalise and utilise their, their data to make uh, uh, better decisions about the, the health of their assets. Okay, so, sorry I overran there. I told you if you gave me 20 minutes, I'd take 25. But uh, thank you for listening. <laughs>